happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you here this morning to worship, and boy, I sure enjoy having the smoke out of our uh, atmosphere here. It's uh, beautiful when we woke up and sunny. It's a little cloudy now, but we'll take it. <clears throat> Very grateful. I invite you to uh, sing this first song with us, Here I Am to Worship. Good morning, Eastgate. Good morning. I'm glad to see everyone here. Welcome to Eastgate Church. And for those joining us online, we're glad to have you join us too. And we hope that you gain a blessing from this worship. I do want to just encourage you to remember turning in your tithes and offerings that at the end of the service, our treasurer is here and available if you have offerings to turn in. And I know a lot of you give online, and that's good, too. And we just want to encourage you to remember your local church in those givings. One thing I want to have you think about today, Psalm 90, verse 12. It says, teach us to number our days that we may learn to apply wisdom. We think about the situations that we live in today, we think about this pandemic, we think about signs of the times, we think about end times and signs of the end. Teach us to number our days so that we can learn to apply wisdom. And I want you to listen carefully as we're blessed by Pastor Eric today and, and think about learning to apply the wisdom that we learn. And, and how to do that on a daily basis. Thank you so much for joining us, and happy Sabbath. Okay, it's time now for the 
kids song. We're going to sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. <laughs> Swing low, sweet cherry God, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet cherry God, coming for to carry me home. I'm going to sing. now for the children's story. Well, good morning. I want to see if some of the young people would stand up right where they are, because you're going to help me with this children's story. There you go. Everybody who's got a daddy, stand up, because this has to do with your daddy. <laughs> that includes everyone. Is what I hear. You're right. Okay. All right, help me out here. Use your fingers. Okay, how much does my daddy love me? Does he love me this much? How much does he love me? Does he love me this much? This much? This much? Yes! He loves me much, much. The thing that I want you to know is your daddy loves you so much. He took the whole day off today, and he wants to spend it with you. Amen. The Sabbath was made for you and your daddy to spend it together. Take time to remember he's with you today. He is here with us. He's with you when you go home. He is wanting to hear what you have to say when you go, wow, there's a deer over there. Or let's read some of his word. Let's find out what he thinks. How much does he love me? Find out. Look at his word. He loves you so much. He's embraced you on the palms of his hands. He loves you. Okay, that's my message. Thank you. Amen. Amen. As we continue now in our worship service this morning, I invite you to sing with us a sweet by and by. You know, I everything going on in our world today, um, just uh, longing more and more for heaven. And Amen. certainly uh, when we woke up this morning to the sun and uh, just a renewed spirit, um, kind of felt like that day that we hope will come soon when God will come back and take us home to his land. That is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we will meet. Sweet by and by, 
song, I invite you to stand if you would like. Sing, this is the air that I breathe. Every breath that we have comes from the Lord.
Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank you so much for the promise of the Sabbath blessing. And we ask, Lord, that you'll join us. We ask, Lord, that you'll shed your spirit on us. Open our minds to the truth of the Sabbath and the purpose of the Sabbath. Teach us your wisdom and teach us how to apply it every day of the week. We thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus that he would be here with us. We want to learn how to share his truth with the world. There's a message for today. There's a message that we have been called to proclaim to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Jesus is coming soon. And we want everyone to join us to welcome Jesus when we see him coming in the clouds of glory. We ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. The smoke is gone. I don't I don't know if uh, this was your experience, but in the midst of the smoke last Sabbath, as I was outside doing necessary things, I actually got a sore throat being out there. That was nasty, and I'm just so thankful that last night the wind came in, there was some rain and it cleansed our air. I'm thankful for that. We need to continue to be praying for those who have been affected by these fires, though. If you've been uh, following things, especially down in the Portland area, um, California, um, even, even in here in Washington State, but I'm thinking of Portland because um, our fellow Seventh-day Adventists in the Portland area have been involved deeply in bringing hope and healing uh, to that community that has been so drastically affected by the fires. And so um, I'm thankful for them. We need to continue to pray for, for all those who have been affected. I want to give a little update as well about what we are doing for our worship service. So um, if you hadn't noticed, we're meeting outside <laughs> because of COVID. Um, if you didn't realize that, we need to talk. But we, at some point, will need to move inside. You probably received uh, a survey monkey survey from me um, asking your perspective on several different items about moving inside. Our church board, our governing body of this local church that you have delegated authority to, uh, discussed what we wanted to do next, what we wanted to do next as a church, as the fall weather approaches, as winter arrives, um, and... And we, as a, as a body, decided that we are going to do one service for now. One service. Um, we may max out our in-sanctuary numbers. And so we're going to have an overflow room in the fellowship hall where we'll be streaming the service in there and putting it on the screen in the fellowship hall. And so just be aware, that's the process we're going to be going through at first. And we're going to be monitoring, you know, how many, how many of us will be gathering on Sabbath morning inside and, and we'll be adjusting uh, as needed to those numbers and playing it by ear. That's what we've been doing since March. We've been playing it by ear. And I really appreciate your patience and I appreciate your cooperation as we've been figuring out how to continue to live as a community of faith in the face of all these challenges that, that have been coming in this wonderful year of 2020. It's been quite the year, has it not? 
Um, but you know what? When we, are, when we are stretched, God sustains us. Um, and I, I believe, I choose to believe that every challenge we face is an opportunity to spread the gospel. We have an opportunity to be a community that is active in the midst of the, all these challenges. And I'm so excited to, to see what God's going to continue to do in the face of this. We are still on mission. Our purpose as an Eastgate church is to share the everlasting gospel with the world. That is our purpose here. And so as we meet outside, as we move inside, we must always keep that vision in place that our purpose is, in to, is to invite others to join the community of faith in the kingdom of heaven. All right? So let's keep that in mind as we do that. We're not just here to be comfortable. We're not just here to consume we're not just here to get a blessing. We are here to be a blessing. That is our purpose. And so as we move inside, let's keep that in mind. That we are here to draw everyone, everyone, each other, as well as the community of Walla Walla and the whole world into a relationship with Jesus. That is our purpose. Keep that in mind as we move inside. That will govern our decisions of how we, how we gather and what we're doing. That's my vision, and I'm sticking to it because that's the vision Jesus has given us. Sound good? Yeah. All right. I'd like to pray with you. I know that we've been praying already this morning, but you can't pray too much. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the grace that you've given us. I thank you for the fresh air you've given us. I thank you for the word you've given us. And I pray that as we open this chapter of Daniel, as we explore chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth that you have for us, that you would open the veil so we can see behind the scenes, that we can understand who you are and how you are active in this world and in this universe on behalf of your people. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Chapter 10. If you got your Bible, you're welcome to open it up to chapter 10. If we were on inside, I would make it really easy because I'd have it on the screen. But now if you want to follow along, you've got to have your Bible out. And that's okay if you want to just listen as well. Chapter 10 of Daniel, he begins. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. What is he referring to here? Once again, Daniel is referring back to chapter 8 and chapter 9. Chapter 8 and chapter 9. In chapter 8, we have the, the ram and the goat, these two symbolic creatures symbolizing um, Medo-Persia and Greece, and then you've got the little horn that was taken from chapter 7, which is broken Christianity, our Christian history from the Middle Ages. And then we have that big time prophecy of 2,300 evenings and mornings, right? In chapter 9, which we looked at the last two weeks, we saw that there is another time prophecy, 490 days or evenings and mornings, we could say, because it's connected to the 2,300. And that, is the, that is all the same thing. The 490 is simply the beginning of the 2,300. And the, the, the big question is, what was that all about? And really, it was all about Jesus. And if you watched last week's teaching online, you're welcome to go back and do that. It's on, it's on Facebook and it's on YouTube. Uh, if you want to if you want to go back and review that you can but you can see that it is all centered around Christ and his work to redeem humanity that's that's the whole purpose of these prophecies to show us God's work on behalf of humanity and so as we begin chapter 10 Daniel talks about the appointed time was long and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision he understood that these weren't literal days of 2,300 literal days or 40, uh, 490 literal days. These were years. In other words, these prophecies covered centuries, Daniel realizes. This is big. This means that the, the culmination of history, 
the great hope of being reconciled physically with God is far in the future, and this troubled Daniel. This gave his heart pain. He realized that he was not going to see the great culmination of history, the hope of heaven, anytime soon because there were centuries to come before these prophecies were completely fulfilled. And he was troubled. He was pained. Verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came to my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three weeks were fulfilled. He is troubled. And so he chooses, we're going to see in a bit, he chooses to pray. When your heart is troubled, more often than not, it means that you need to pray. I don't know if you experienced that, but I can tell that God's calling me to pray when my heart is troubled. When I have something inside of me, some turmoil, some, something that is upsetting me, something that is giving me unrest, that is, that is nudging me. I believe that's the Holy Spirit nudging me to pray about it. And that's what Daniel does. He chooses to pray, and for three weeks he fasts, he prays, he doesn't do his hair. I mean, he is just focusing in on prayer. Verse 4, now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, in linen whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His, his body was like beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like torches of fire. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. And the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled and hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I reta retained no strength. And I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. In short, the dude fainted. He was so overwhelmed by this vision of this being that he fainted. He couldn't stand it. It was too much for him. He, he just gave out and was on the ground dead cold. Now you may be thinking, where else have we seen a vision like this? There are several places in Scripture that we actually see this individual showing up in the same way. The most clear one is in the book of Revelation chapter 1. In chapter 1, we see the same individual described in much the same way. It's very obviously the same person. And I, I want to share with you that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is Jesus before he became a human being. This is Jesus before he became one of us. This is Jesus before he became a little zygote in the, in the womb of Mary and grew up as a human being. This is Jesus in his priestly role, his high priestly role, became, before he became one of us. Isn't it amazing that Jesus was involved in earth's history before Jesus became one of us? To me, that's significant. It means that Jesus has always been there. It also shows me that Jesus is divine. This, this reaction that, this, that Daniel has to Jesus is a reaction that people have to the divine, to the one who is the creator of all, 
to the one who is over all. This is the great God of the universe, the eternal one, the one who spoke everything into, this, into existence. He is now revealing himself to Daniel as the high priest of all humanity. Amen. That's how he's dressed, is as the high priest. This shows me that the ministry of Jesus began before he became human, continued through his ministry on earth, and continues today in heaven on our behalf. Jesus has always been, was, and always will be our high priest, ministering on our behalf in heaven. So Daniel faints in the face of this vision of the pre-incarnate word. Verse 10. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. He's now in the crawling position. He kind of raises himself up because he comes back to his senses. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Now the text here doesn't make it completely 100% obvious, but I want to point out that this is not Jesus speaking to him. Well, how do we know that? Well, first of all, the one who has always been coming to Daniel to explain things to him has been Gabriel. You can go back to chapter 8, chapter 9, and see that Gabriel is the one who has always been sent to explain things to Daniel, to help him understand. But there's more to it than that. If you look at the verse that we just read there, in verse 10 or 11, he says, Now I have been sent to you to help you understand. I have been sent to you. This is a messenger from God sent to help Daniel understand the vision, to understand what he's been shown, to understand more about this big time prophecy and what is to come. In reality, this angel, most likely Gabriel, has been sent to reveal to him information that will only be given in the next chapter, in chapter 11. Chapter 10 is simply the introduction to chapter 11. They are inseparable. They are continuous from chapter 10 to chapter 11. And Gabriel is here to tell him about chapter 11. Here in chapter 10, he introduces what he's here to do. Verse 12. Verse 12 and 13 are significant, and this is where we're going to get the bulk of today's study. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. A couple of weeks ago, we studied the, the Jewish sanctuary, the Hebrew sanctuary. And if you remember my really high-tech PowerPoint called a, a pad of paper, where I outlined the sanctuary, there were all these elements in the sanctuary. And one of those elements was an altar that was right in front of the inner curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. What was that altar called? Do you remember that? Right in front of that curtain the altar of incense, and, and its purpose was to symbolize the prayers of God's people ascending to heaven. They were to fill the sanctuary with a sweet-smelling perfume, symbolizing the prayers of God's people. And this indicates to me that God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to hear from you. He, and when you pray to him, it makes him happy. It pleases him when you come to him and pray. Even though he already knows your thoughts, he already knows your desires, he already knows your fears, he wants to hear from you. 
And so here, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, Gabriel reminds Daniel that from the very first word that you spoke, Daniel, I was dispatched to answer. You were heard, and I came to respond. Is it safe to assume that all of us can have that same experience? That when we bow our heads in prayer, when we lift our hearts to the Lord, that God hears us instantly, and he responds to us instantly. No delay. No waiting to make sure you've got the words right. No waiting to make sure that you've got it all figured out. No waiting to make sure that, that you say things in the proper order, in the proper way. God hears you, and God responds instantly. No exceptions. God wants to hear from you, and he wants to respond to you. But there's something significant that happens. It's been three weeks. Three weeks. Have you ever prayed and haven't gotten the response that you were looking for? It didn't feel as though anything was happening. Anybody ever had that experience? My hand's up. My hand's up. Yeah. There's a couple of reasons for that that I want to highlight today, biblical reasons, and I'm sure there are more reasons for that as well that either I haven't thought of or that I don't have time for today. Let me highlight two of them. First, in the book of John, chapter 15, in prayer meeting, we looked at this passage this past Thursday. Uh, just want you, to, want you to know that if you haven't been joining us for prayer meeting on Zoom, you've been missing out. Amen. It's been good. It's been a blessing, and I, and I hope that you can join us on Zoom. It's just it's about a half hour, super focused. We don't waste time. We share concerns. We look at a verse on prayer, and then we pray. Our purpose is to pray. But anyway, this is the verse we looked at this past, this past Thursday evening in John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, we've looked at this before, if you abide in me, in other words, to stick with me, stay with me, stay connected to me, divide, derive your sustenance from me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, all right, two things, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. In other words, if you make my words, the word of God, a part of your life, if you incorporate them into your life and make them a part of who you are, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. What a promise. If you abide in me, stay connected and derive your sustenance from me, and if my words abide in you, you can ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. It's conditional, is it not? It's conditional. First of all, we have to stay connected to Jesus. Second of all, we are called to make his word a part of our life so that we are transformed by his word. And he actually says that in that passage. You have been transformed by the words or cleansed by the words that I have spoken to you. And I believe that this is how that works, that as we walk with Jesus, as we abide in Christ, as we incorporate his truth, his word into, into our lives, it's not that he gives me everything that I automatically want, but what I want changes. I surrender more fully, and I'm okay with his answers. Sometimes his answer is yes. Sometimes his answer is no. Sometimes his answer is wait. Sometimes his answer is trust me. Just trust me. You're going to be okay. Just trust me. 
So that, I think, is one of the reasons why we feel like we don't get the answers we want, because maybe we need to continue to journey with Christ where we are continually and more filled with his word and abiding more closely, and then we will see that more clearly. But there's a second element today in verse 13 that broadens our perspective of answered prayer. Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king, kings of Persia. Here, Gabriel pulls back the veil a little bit on something that we don't often see explained or experience obviously in life. Gabriel says that as he was on his way to answer this prayer of Daniel, he was waylaid by the king or the prince of Persia. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, I don't think this was Cyrus. Cyrus didn't have any power to stop an angel coming to answer Daniel. This was, I believe, a demonic power that was trying to influence world events, but not only influence world events by, by overseeing Persia, he was also trying to stop Gabriel from making it to Daniel. Because he knew that Gabriel was carrying a message to Daniel that would transform Daniel's and ours understanding of God's working in the world. And if he could stop that, he could, he could increase our discouragement and increase our questioning and increase our lack of faith because there's less information for us to base our faith on. But God had a plan to communicate chapter 11 to us so that we can have a deeper understanding of God's plan for this world. And Satan said, no, I've got to stop that because this is important stuff, according to God. This is important stuff that God wants to communicate with Daniel and with the rest of history. Make sense? He's got the long game in mind. And so Gabriel is stopped by the king of Persia. This indicates to me that this conflict between good and evil in our universe is deeper, broader, more intense than sometimes we give it credit for. You'd think, well, God's on Gabriel's side. Couldn't he just snap his fingers and that conflict would be one, right? I mean, it's God versus Satan. God's the creator, the great master of the universe. Couldn't he just snap his fingers, it'd be over, and Satan couldn't withstand that? There must be some ground rules in place that, that allows Satan to have influence in this world and even slow down the advancement of God's work. There must be something, there must be rules set in place that influence this conflict. Now, I don't know what all those rules are, but they definitely give... Satan and his demons' ability to impact the advancement of spiritual good in this universe. The prince of the king of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, and the New King James and many other versions says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. One of the chief, Michael, one of the chief princes. I did some research on that this week. Uh, there's, some, there's some really good expositors out there who, who say, well, this, this individual, Michael, is simply one of the top angels in heaven because it says one of the chief princes. So it couldn't, it couldn't be anything higher than an angel, a created angel. As I did some research this week, I, I found a, a, a commentator who, who is an incredible Hebrew scholar. Um, he's at the Adru's University uh, Seminary, Jacques Dukan. 
he said something significant. He said that the words used here don't just mean one of the chief princes, but could be more accurately translated, literally, first of the first princes or prince of princes. Prince of princes. We see the same phrase in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, where Jesus is referred to as the prince of princes. Interesting. It's not just another angelic leader. This is the prince of princes. Let's broaden the picture, though, a little bit more. Maybe you saw the newsletter that that came out yesterday in, in kind of my introductory paragraph to today's sermon. Maybe you spent some time looking at that. In my introductory paragraph, I, I told this story or something like it. Several hundred years before Daniel, Joshua, the leader of Israel, who had taken over after Moses died on, to, on the top of Mount Nebo, we'll get back to that. When, when Joshua took over, they crossed the, the Jordan River and they, they came to the point where they knew the next step would be to deal with Jericho. Now, Jericho was a significant city. It was a, a powerful city there, close to the banks of the Jordan. It's described in pretty significant terms. And here, Jericho is described as a, one with massive walls and you know, uh, unassailable. And so Joshua decides one night that he's going to go check it out. He leaves the camp of Israel, and he heads toward Jericho. And I can imagine in my mind's eye that there maybe are some trees. And at the edge of the trees, Joshua stops, and he's, he's looking at these walls in the dark as they rise, insurmountable ahead of him. And he's, he's looking for a, a weakness in the walls, and of course he can't find any. They've built them well. And as he's looking at them, out of the corner of his eye, he sees some movement, and he, he turns, and he, and he sees an individual standing there, a warrior with a sword, and his first thought is, is this one of our guards, or is this one of Jericho's guards? And so he asks, are you for us or against us? In verse 14 of Joshua chapter 5, this person responds, no. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Let's break that down a little bit. Joshua asked, Are you on my side or on their side? And the commander of the Lord's army said, no. No. He doesn't say, yes, I'm on your side. He doesn't say, I'm on Jericho's side. He said, no, I am here as the commander of the Lord's armies. This is significant to me because if we extrapolate that a little, out a little bit, maybe it means that God is for humanity and not just for a specific people. Maybe God wants to save everyone and is, a, is on everyone's side when it comes down to it in the end. He wants to save all of humanity. Amen? Amen. And so when he says, I, I'm not on your side and I'm not, I'm not on their side, but I am here as the leader of heaven's armies, Joshua realizes this isn't just another being. This isn't just another guard from one of these two camps. This isn't even just a messenger from heaven. This is the Lord himself. He falls down, Scripture says, and he worships. Now, whenever that happens, you can see that in the book of Revelation. When that happens, and it's just an angel, the prophet gets corrected, right? You see that in the book of Revelation. You can look it up there sometime. The prophet is corrected immediately. Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant. Don't worship me. Worship God. Joshua's not corrected. This is God himself, not showing up this time as the high priest, but showing up this time as the leader of heaven's armies. God leads his own army to battle. 
if we jump to the end of Scripture, close to the end, the next to last book of Scripture in the book of Jude, there, there's a significant passage there that actually mentions Michael there, and I'd like to look at that for a moment with you. Jude is just a tiny little book with only one chapter. I didn't write down. Oh, there we go. Verse 9. Verse 9, Jude writes, Yet Michael, the archangel, get to that in a second, in contending with the devil. What does it mean to contend with someone? To resist, to fight with, to have a conflict with, right? When contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So here, he's, Michael is called the archangel, and he's in a conflict with Satan. Now, the, the word archangel is an interesting one. It, literally, the word angel means messenger. Messenger. Simply means messenger. And, and archangel means literally the ruler of the angels. And in, throughout Scripture, there is only ever one archangel men mentioned, one ruler of the angels mentioned, mentioned and that is Michael. It's Michael. And, and this word Mar Michael is only ever used in the conflict between God and Satan. That's the only context in which this, this title Michael is used. And this word Michael is only ever used when, he's, when, he, is be, when he is the leader of heaven's armies in a conflict with Satan. Now, I'd like to go for a while, for a few minutes, to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Several years ago, about four years ago now, we were working through a series on the book of Revelation. We had started in Revelation chapter 1, and we were going chapter through chapter through Revelation, chapter by chapter. And we came to Revelation chapter 12, and we had, we had gone through the first six verses, and then Juliana got sick. And, and I never picked up that series again. I never went back and looked at that series in that same deep way as I had been doing at that point. One day I want to get back to it, and continue through the book of Revelation with you. Because I love, I love what's coming up. There's some beautiful stuff coming up. And I'd like to look at verses 7 through 12 of Revelation chapter 12. Verses 7 through 12 with you today. We've referenced it in the past briefly. But I, I want to I search it out today. And once again, pull back the veil on what is going on behind the scenes in this great battle between good and and evil. Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So, we have two sides in this battle. We have Michael and his angels. We have the dragon and his angels. If we wanted to go to Isaiah, if we wanted to go to Ezekiel, we would see developed in those two passages an understanding that this conflict began because an angel who was one of the top angels in heaven decided that he wanted to replace God on the throne, that he wanted to, to be divine, to be on the throne of heaven. And so he began this conflict with God. And so there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, the ruler of the angels, the archangel, the leader of angelic armies, and his angels 
fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, if we compare this to the passages we've just looked at in Jude, in Daniel, and in Joshua, we see that the leader of the angelic armies is none other than Jesus himself. A divine being who leads his armies to battle against Satan on behalf of his people. God is actively engaged in the war against evil. He's not just going to outsource it to his angels. He is leading the charge. He is taking the initiative. But the dragon and his angels did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. If you look at the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3, there's a fantastic passage there we've looked at before where Joshua the high priest, not the same Joshua as the book of Joshua, this is the high priest Joshua many, a few hundred years later. Joshua the high priest, Zechariah sees him in vision and he's got really dirty clothes on. And in this vision, the dirty clothes represent Joshua's sins and the sins of all of Israel. And Satan is standing there next to Joshua, accusing him, saying, you can't forgive him. You can't save him. You can't give him grace. Look at all the things that he's done. Look at all the things that his people have done. Look at how dirty his clothes are. He is the accuser. In fact, the word Satan literally means accuser. And so Satan is there to accuse him. And the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, he was headed for destruction. He was headed for eternal death, but I have rescued him. I've pulled him from the fire. He is now mine, and I am his. I've rescued him from your clutches. And so at that point, Satan was in the courtroom of heaven as the prosecuting attorney saying you can't save him you can't save her they're mine look at what they've done but here in revelation chapter 7 we see the story of when there's this conflict between the leader of heaven's armies jesus himself and satan and who wins jesus, jesus. Jesus wins. And because of that, Satan is kicked out of heaven, and that means that in the courtroom of heaven, there is no longer anyone there to accuse you. It reminds me of the story of when Jesus was presented with a, a woman who had been caught in a compromising position, caught in adultery. And, and Jesus, as she, is, as she is brought in before him, and they want him to declare death on her, he bends over and starts writing in the dust. Many think that he was writing the sins of the accusers in the dust. It's neat that he did that in the dust so that a wind would come by and just blow it away and nobody would see it. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, the accusers leave, leaving only Jesus and this poor lady. And he says, is anyone left here to accuse you? And she says, no, Lord. Go and sin no more. In heaven, in the court of heaven, is there anyone there left to accuse you? No. There is no one left in heaven to accuse you. And if you have given your hearts and your minds and your lives to Jesus and accepted his transforming grace that washes you clean of sin, you are safe in Christ if you put your faith in him. You have nothing to fear if you've put your faith in Christ. Chosen to trust him. And so Satan was kicked out of heaven. That great serpent was cast out. That serpent of old 
called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, a time-dependent word, Now, salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. This is probably an angel saying this. Maybe God himself, but at least an angel saying, our brethren who were being accused, and this is talking about you and me and all of God's people throughout humanity, throughout eternity, throughout earth history. Our brethren, our sistren, who have been accused by Satan, Satan has been kicked out and there's no one, no, no one here anymore to accuse them. And when did this happen? This happened at the cross. The greatest battle of all history was not a battle of bombs and guns and fists and knives and conventional war. The greatest battle happened when Christ stretched out his arms on a rough wooden tree and he died for you and me. And in doing that, he defeated Satan forever. At that point, his destruction was assured. There is nothing else that can happen to him but be destroyed. There is no hope for him. He's made his choice. The angels who followed him have made their choice. But you guys, we still have a choice to make. We still have a choice to make in this battle between good and evil. And the war is still going on between good and evil. They are still fighting. And what are they fighting over? They're fighting over you. They're fighting over me. And every choice for Christ is one more advancement that the kingdom of God is making on the battlefield because you are the ground over which Satan and Jesus are fighting. Now, salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come they're here now because Christ has been victorious. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they, God's people, overcame him by two things. By the blood of the Lamb, trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. Telling others what God has done in you and through you. Two things. You want to be victorious in this life? Trust in the blood of Jesus and tell other people what God has done for you. And you will be victorious over the evil one. That's what it takes. Trust in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it, but he gives it to you. And tell people what he's done for you. That's what it takes. They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Oh, there's so much beyond this world, you guys. This world is wonderful, and God's made it for us. And, and it's here for our blessing and for our enjoyment, but we shouldn't cling to it. If God wants to lay me to rest, I've got so much more to look forward to. There's so much more beyond and when we are in eternity, when we are with Christ, this life will seem like just an instant, a distant, faint memory. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. This is how you can participate in this battle between good and evil, between Michael and the Prince of Persia, between Michael and the Prince of the United States. This is how you can participate in this war, is trusting in Jesus and telling others of what God has done for you. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Satan's destruction is assured, and he knows it. 
So he's trying to cause as much trouble as possible because he wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be distracted. He wants you to be led astray by all kinds of things so that you lose sight of Jesus. So you take your eyes off of him so that you don't continue to put your faith in the blood of Christ and tell others of what he's done for you. He wants you to get off track so that, so that he gains some ground. But I want to tell you today, it's not worth it. No matter what Satan does to you, no matter what comes your way, no matter what you face in this life, it is not worth giving up your fight. Amen. There, there are some of who have asked us, Stacy and, and me, um, after we lost Juliana, after we all lost Juliana, have you lost your faith yet? And I appreciate what my precious wife said. Why would I want to do that and give up any chance of seeing her again? No matter what kind of pain comes your way, no matter what you face in life, it is not worth giving up on Christ because this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I've got so much ahead of me. And one day, Christ will come and he will remake this world the way he originally designed it to be and we will live forever with him. And this battle that we live in the middle of, the battle that Daniel tells us about, the battle that Joshua tells us about, the battle that Revelation tells us about, it will be done. Amen. It'll be over. And we will no longer have to live in the midst of a war zone, but we will live in the presence of our Savior. We will live with Jesus. So I encourage you today, don't give up. No matter what you're facing, no matter what comes your way, no matter what the, the trouble that you face in the midst of this battle, our, our, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against each other, other people in America and beyond. That's what the Gentiles worry about. I mean that as those who don't have an eternal perspective. But we fight against principalities against powers, against Satan himself. And if we were on our own, we would have no hope. But we have Michael on our side. Michael means who is like God. We have the, the leader of heaven's armies on our side. And if he is on our side, we have nothing to fear. And so as the praise team comes up, I'd like to pray with you as we close. Lord, I give my heart, my mind, my life to you. I as myself, I choose to put my faith in the blood of Jesus. I choose to tell the stories of your work in my life. And Lord, I pray that through that, I, I pray that we would be victorious in this battle against the evil one. Oh, Lord, I pray you'd come soon. Keep us faithful to you. We love you. Amen.
Father, we thank you again for that Sabbath blessing. And we ask that you be with us as we go from here. And as we leave, may we know that it was good that we were here. We ask that you be with your people around the world, Lord. Guide them, guard them, protect them, and lead them. We ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If you would like to meet with an elder for prayer, there are a couple of elders here available. And happy Sabbath.